On today's episode, I put together my top takeaways and favorite audio clips from my interviews during the first half of 2022. It is truly a privilege and an honor to have the opportunity to get to chat with so many great investors and host the Millennial Investing Podcast for you all. I was joined by some brilliant investors such as Dan Rasmussen, Bill Nigren, John Huber, Nick Majuli, William Green, Chris Kuyper, and so many more. During this episode, I pull clips chatting about various asset classes and topics from index funds and individual stocks to gold, Bitcoin, and the overall current macro environment. I'm a huge fan of learning from a variety of different viewpoints so I can form my own opinion and you as a listener can do the same. I'll be the first to admit that 2022 has been quite the learning experience, so it was fun to look back and pull from some of my favorite episodes. A quick announcement before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to mention that TIP recently started releasing a daily newsletter. Our team has been doing a really great job keeping me updated on financial markets, as well as tying in some really good financial lessons, I think. I've really been enjoying it. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can go to theinvestorspodcast.com slash email dash list. That's theinvestorspodcast.com slash email dash list, or click the link in the show notes below. With that, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with my top takeaways from the first half of 2022. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network where your hosts, Robert Leonard and Clay Fink, interview successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. I wanted to kick off today's episode with a clip from my interview with William Green. I interviewed William back on episode 131, He wrote the brilliant book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, and has recently joined the team at TIP as a podcast host. During William and I's conversation, we covered what he learned from interviewing Charlie Munger. Give it a listen. Since you bring up Charlie, I'm curious, were there any other big takeaways you had in interviewing him? Yeah, the most valuable thing that I got from interviewing Charlie, which I, I did in Los Angeles originally, I, I traveled 3,000 miles to interview him uh, originally with the promise of a 10 minute interview. And so it's a little bit crazy, but I ended, I ended up subsequently talking to him more recently. But the biggest thing that I learned from Charlie was this incredibly simple and practical and also quite profound idea, which is that instead of trying to be smarter, what you want to do actually is try to be consistently less stupid. And it sounds kind of, kind of like a joke, but here's Munger, this genius, who's probably the brightest guy in investing pretty much with the possible exception of someone like Ed Thorpe, who I also write about. It's another genius, brilliant guy, Charlie Munger. And he spends his whole time trying to figure out how can I be less stupid? And so when I went to interview him, I'm sort of sitting knee to knee with this sage. And he's kind of peering at me through these very thick glasses because he's blind in one eye and, um, and he can barely see. And I, I knew that I didn't have much time. So I said to him, I, yeah, I had to cut right to the chase. So I said, Charlie, I, I regard you as the, the grand master of stupidity reduction. I, I said, why, why is that such a critical focus for you? And he said, because it works, it works. And he starts to explain that what he does is instead of trying to be brilliant the whole time, which comes more naturally to him than it, than it does to most of us, what, he's, what he does is he says, okay, let me figure out what a dumb person would do in this situation, whether it's investing or anything else in life. And so, so he says, if, for example, you want to be a good investor, a very successful investor, start by thinking what a terrible investor would do. And so list all of the dumb mistakes that terrible investors routinely make. And then having figured that out, don't do that. So, so it's something that he's taken from this 19th century mathematician, a guy called Carl Gustav Jacobi, who said, invert, always invert. This is what Charlie's doing. He's inverting. He's solving the problem backwards. So he's not saying, let me figure out how to be a great investor. He's saying, let me figure out first how to be a terrible investor. And that's really helpful because actually, it's really easy to identify dumb mistakes, what, what he calls standard stupidities or idiotic behavior. So, so he'll look at things like the fact that investors routinely buy whatever's going up and Wall Street will convince them 
that whatever's going up is worth buying because Wall Street gets paid to do that. They, they don't really care whether it's going up or down. They get paid for commissions frequently. And so, so people will buy stocks that are at the top of the cycle, for example, assuming that it's going to continue to be good. And then the stock goes off a cliff and the investor um, gets hosed. Or another thing people routinely do is they listen to predictions that market seers, market strategists at these big Wall Street firms or, or idiot journalists like me are making where they say, you know, the market's going to go up 20% over the next year or this sector is going to be the best sector. And the truth is, nobody knows. And this is a really chilling realization. But once you actually start to be like, well, wait, so all of these predictions are kind of bogus. It's pretty liberating because you know that you can stop listening to all of these prognosticators who pretend that they know the future. And so for me, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, well, look, if, if Buffett can't predict the future, if Munger can't predict the future, if Howard Marks can't predict the future, then I sure as hell can't. And so if they're saying that that's a standard stupidity to believe that you can, you can tell whether the market's going up or down, that's a really good default position for me to say, okay, let, let, let me not um, fall into that trap of, of trying to guess where the market's going to go. I've got to position myself. So I'm going to be okay whether the market falls or rises. If, if it plunges, I'm going to survive. I'm going to stay in the game. And if it goes up, I'm going to benefit from it. And, and over the long term, the market has always gone up. The, the trajectory has been amazing because productivity increases, populations increase. It has this incredible upward trajectory over centuries. So, so the long-term prognosis is likely to be good, but you have to avoid these standard stupidities of jumping in and out, believing people who make predictions, trading hyperactively, um, having excessively high expenses, for example, if you jump in and out or you have short-term, short-term tax liabilities because you've been trading in and out, constantly saying, how could this go wrong? How could this, how could this ruin me? What would a really dumb person do in this situation? And let me, let me at least not do that. I love referring back to William's book and the timeless principles he has in there to help me form a framework for how I want to invest. Next, I wanted to play a clip from Nick Majuli, who was asked why he prefers to invest in index funds rather than individual stocks. I think this is a really important consideration for someone just getting into investing. And this is a big reason why I always have some portion of my portfolio in index funds. Here it is. The advice to not buy individual stocks isn't new. Jack Bogle, JL Collins, even Warren Buffett, and many, many others have said that most people shouldn't buy individual stocks. However, rarely when this advice is given, is it actually backed by real data and facts. I'm not saying that that data and facts don't exist, but usually when people on social media say you shouldn't buy individual stocks, they don't provide data and facts to back up their argument. Since you are someone who studies data religiously, break down with data why individual investors don't know if they're just lucky when they pick a good individual stock and why most investors shouldn't do it. Yeah. So when I think how I like to think about this and how I broke it down in the book is there's two different arguments. The main argument when most people in Buffett and Collins, all these people are saying, don't buy individual stocks. I do think they have some data. And that data is basically like you look at like what I, what, there's the SPIVA reports, SPIVA, you look those up on Google and you'll see that over like any five-year period, something like 60 to 80% of active managers cannot beat their benchmarks. It's usually like 75% after fees and everything. You know, most of the professionals with analysts and all these resources can't be just a passive index fund, right? And so after a five-year period, so what it shows is like, it's really tough to do. So just by picking a passive index fund, you're at the 80th percentile. So I'm going to call that the financial argument, right? And that's the argument most people make. They're saying, hey, like you shouldn't do this because you're going to make less money. And that's fine. That's the argument. That's what I'm saying. I brought that up. I have to address it because that's the one most people talk about. And that's fine in its own right. But that's not the argument I make. The argument I make is what I call the existential argument, which is what you're talking about. An existential argument is basically like, how do you know that you're good at stock picking, right? Like it, with so many endeavors in life, you can identify skill relatively quickly. And, I, and the, the examples I give is, let's say, you know, you, myself and LeBron James went out to a basketball court. You would tell pretty quickly, let's say you didn't know who LeBron James was. You've never heard of this guy or just a similar LeBron James figure. We go out and play. You're going to know pretty quickly. I can't play basketball and he can. You're not going to, there's no luck. I'm not going to get lucky and beat him, right? Unless something happens, some, like he hurts himself on the very first play. There's no way I'm going to beat him, right? 
you can tell skill pretty quickly. It's the same thing with like if you're a computer programmer, you're going to know like, oh, does this person know what they're doing or they don't know how to run the program? Like, it's going to be obvious within minutes if someone knows what they're talking about, right? But with picking stocks, you don't know. The fact is we can go like you and I, Robert, could go and buy, you can pick a portfolio, I can pick a portfolio. And we may not know like after a month, a year, five years, 10 years, I could just get lucky. I could put my money in Amazon in 2002 and you could have put it in something else. And I just held on and I just beat you because I got one lucky pick that crushed all your other picks and there's nothing you could have done. So luck can overpower skill. And so there's some data. There was a great paper called, I think, can... I think it's called Can Mutual Funds Pick Stars or something like that. I can't remember the exact name of it, but there's basically a paper I, I referenced in the book. And like basically they're asking, is there stock picking skill? And they found that they can identify, they bootstrapped and did all these things, which basically means they just like they took some data and they tried to reimagine what the distribution of returns looks like. That's what bootstrapping means. And basically they said 10% of people have actual skill. And that's the number they pick. I'm not saying it's a perfect number. Let's say it's 10, 15%, it doesn't really matter, but let's just use the 10% figure. So let's say 10% of people have skill with certainty and it can be identified, right? And let's assume that another 10% don't have skill and we can also identify that. So we can identify the best and the worst pretty easily. That means that four out of five people, 80%, you're not going to know if you're good. So why would you play this game, pick individual stocks when you don't even know if you're good at it? Who I'm addressing here, I'm not addressing people that say, oh, I'm going to take 5% of my money and put it in individual stocks. I would consider that fun money. You're doing it for fun. You like doing it. That's fine. Have a ball. Enjoy it. I have nothing against that. I'm talking about the people that have 80, 90, 100% of their money individual stock picks. I think it's really difficult to do that. And I think the existential crisis is you have to look yourself in the mirror every day and say, am I actually good at this or am I just lucky? And you're not going to know. Unlike almost everything else, your people out there doing things like, you know, if you're good at doing something or not, you have some idea of your skill and your values in most endeavors. It's just really tough for me to recommend that people pick stocks given you're not going to know if you're good. And even if you are good, the best managers, Baird did a study where they found that the absolute best managers will underperform at some point. So it's like, is that underperformance just a natural lull or have I lost my skill? Did I used to be good and now I'm not? Like, There's all sorts of questions that you're going to just eat yourself up mentally over. And I'm like, why go through all that? Avoid it all. Be a passive investor and be at the 80th percentile. And people say, you know, passive investors have no conviction. Oh, you guys are just, you have no conviction over everything. No, I have more conviction than active investors because I've seen the data. I'm convinced that me just picking the default option of being a passive investor is going to beat 75 to 80% of people. And that is why that's important for me because I have conviction that just doing that is going to win out. And the fact is most of these stock pickers don't have that. They say, oh, I have conviction in these companies, but they could underperform, right? And so why spend all this time and still underperform at the end of the day? That's the question I have. Another big debate in the personal finance industry is market timing. Many people try and time the market's tops and bottoms, but Nick believes that dollar cost averaging is the best strategy. Here's a clip from Robert's interview with him where he explains his thinking on this. I was working a part-time job in college at a large credit union, and we had an in-house financial advisor who randomly taught me one day about dollar cost averaging. He knew I was a finance enthusiast and was studying it in school. So he decided to come into my office and teach me about dollar cost averaging because he believed in it. After that, I had always found articles to support my idea that DCA is the best way to go. I'm not sure if this was confirmation bias, just working its magic, or if DCA is truly the best. But after starting this podcast, I've had some guests say they don't think DCA is the best and that they have data that supports lump sum investing. Your opinion is that no one can beat dollar cost averaging and people should invest as frequently as they can. Break down why dollar cost averaging is the best strategy. Of course. So I think the first thing we need to address is when we say, we, I don't even know if you just realized it, but you just referenced two different definitions of dollar cost averaging. And this is nothing that you've done wrong. This is a huge issue in the personal finance and investment community. There are two different definitions of dollar cost averaging, and they mean very different things. So the dollar cost averaging, the original definition, which I think Benjamin Graham came up with, he says, when you're just buying over time, every time, let's say you get your money in your 401k every two weeks or twice a month, whatever it is, and you're buying, like every time you get the money, you buy right away. That's considered dollar cost averaging. Every time you get paid, you invest your money, right? That's dollar cost averaging. But then the dollar cost averaging you just referred to is like if someone got an inheritance of like $100,000 or they sold a business or something and they have that 100000 instead of putting it into the market right away, they slowly, what I call average in. In the book, I, I don't like calling that dollar cost averaging. I call that averaging into the market because you have the sum already and you're averaging it in versus dollar cost averaging. I think the original definition is just buying over time and buying as frequently as you can. So if you really think about it, every time you get paid in your, four, like let's say you get paid and you invest in your 401k, 
you're really doing a miniature lump sum. It's like you took a little bit of money and you did a lump sum straight into the market. And you, because buying as frequently as you can, that is dollar cost averaging, but really is it's a form of like lump sum. You're lump summing, but just these little tiny lump sums over time. And so when we're talking about lump sum versus do- with the, uh, that other version of dollar cost averaging, which I call average in, lump sum is clearly superior. So, but that just means like buy as soon as you can. Generally, that pays off because markets generally go up, right? So you want to get in sooner. I, I've given examples already at the beginning of this podcast, but the data in there is pretty clear. Like there's like basically like an 80% chance that you're going to make more money if you just put the money in now versus if you wait or if you average in over the course of a year. So when I say dollar cost averaging, even God couldn't be dollar cost averaging. That when I'm talking about that, I'm saying like market timing, trying to pick when to buy dips is less optimal than just buying every single month for forever. So that's the whole idea. Dollar cost averaging, just keep buying are basically synonyms, but just keep buying has you know less syllables. So it's a little bit easier to say. So that's the whole idea. So I just want to make sure we're clear on definitions because when we start throwing those terms around, people are talking about different things and not even realizing, it. and it can be very confusing. And I don't know how to solve this as a community. I'm not going to be like, oh, we need to say this. Like, I can't make people choose language. I just think we should start saying, you know, lump sum versus average in. And then dollar cost averaging is like what you do in your 401k or every time you get paid and you buy, right? You're just buying over time. You're buying as soon as you can. So the main point is to buy as soon as possible. Buy quickly, I think is the phrase I would use. So I hope that clarifies my stance. As most of you know, I enjoy learning about individual stocks and having some portion of my portfolio in individual companies. Buffett is a huge fan of owning high quality companies in particular. He's known for saying that it's better to buy a great company at a fair price than a fair company at a great price. Because over the long run, the company will grow its per share earnings that more than make up for the higher price you're paying originally. Here's a clip from my conversation with Alex Morris, where he discusses his thoughts on paying up for a quality company. I also wanted to pull in a Charlie Munger quote, who I know you are a huge fan of. And his quote is, if the business earns 6% on capital over 40 years and you hold it for 40 years, you're not going to make much different than a 6% return, even if you originally buy it at a huge discount. Conversely, if a business earns 18% on capital over 20 or 30 years, even if you pay an expensive looking price, you'll end up with a fine result. Now with that, how are you able to balance buying businesses that earn a high return on capital without paying too extraordinary of a price? Well, the short answer is that it's very difficult. You know, and let's stick with Charlie Munger or Berkshire because that's probably a good way to think about it. You know, Coca-Cola is a business that would probably fit in this bucket of willing to own at a high price because it has attractive returns on capital. I think what's probably happened over the past 20 years or so is that the returns on capital have remained very strong, but it's harder for them to generate attractive growth because just of the underlying dynamics in the categories that they really compete in and thrive in. So you know, that's basically a long way of saying that it's very, very difficult to make long-term comments about the sustainability of a business and the sustainability of ROIC and growth. At the DJCO meeting, Charlie was basically asked this question as it relates to Costco. And I think his answer was really interesting. He basically said in a roundabout way, for me, Costco fits the definition of that quote. And you know, I think the underlying logic for that belief is, I'm going to get these numbers wrong off the top of my head, but you know, they have roughly 600 warehouses in the US, which is a small number relative to you know most retail concepts. Obviously, it's a different animal, but they have 600 warehouses in the US and a couple hundred outside the US, two or 300. They've shown a proven ability to get that warehouse concept to travel internationally, which is massive as you think about the ability to grow for not the next 5 or 10 years, the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So I think he's effectively saying, I think the growth algorithm that they have, call it this 3 to 4% unit growth, you know, low to mid single digit comps, really attractive unit economics and an ability to return capital to shareholders as they've primarily done with special dividends over the past 10 to 20 years. I think he's effectively saying to you, I realize that you think the headline valuation looks expensive, but I see a path for this business to continue to grow its per share intrinsic value by something north of 10% per year for a very long period of time and with a very high degree of confidence. And anybody can go run the numbers. The multiple going from pulling these numbers out of my head, the multiple going from 40 to 20 in five years is a huge headwind to IRRs. 
the multiple going from 40 to 20 in 50 years is a much lower headwind IRR. So I think, and again, this is incredibly difficult to do and you have to be very picky in order to find even five or 10 businesses that really pass that test for you. But when you find them, it makes it very difficult to... I think it's an air. I'll be even a little bit more uh, affirmative in this belief. It's an air to look at a business like that and go, well, it trades at a PE of 30, the market's at 20, it's expensive. That's faulty logic, in my opinion, if you're truly a long-term investor. On the contrary to Nick Majuli's point on only investing in index funds, I asked John Huber what advantages he believes he has as an individual stock picker. He's a fund manager himself and runs a pretty concentrated portfolio. Here's his take on why he believes he actually has a big advantage over most other fund managers. Now, you wrote a piece that outlines that investors need to have some sort of an edge if they want to have above average returns, such as beating the market. What kind of investing edge do you believe that you have relative to others? I think the biggest edge that investors have today, and I would include myself in this cohort, is the ability to think long-term. And so I know this is a sort of a phrase, long-term thinking. There's a term out there called time arbitrage, which is basically being able to capture the spread between the current conditions and maybe the conditions five years out or seven years out. The term basically means being able to look out further than most market participants have the ability to look out. And the reason why it's so difficult for people is number one, it's, I think it's just human emotion, human nature. People want results now, they want results quickly. And so there's an extreme amount of emphasis on catalysts and things that might drive stock prices in the short run. And obviously, if you can make money now, it's better than making money later. But that game has become so difficult. And so I think like the informational advantage that that once was out there has now been marginalized. And there may still be informational edge in certain pockets of the market. And at certain times, perhaps it's possible to gain small edges here and there. But I think the biggest edge in the market is just the ability to behave in a way that's very difficult for other investors to behave, whether it's due to their own impatience or more often is due to just the institutional constraints that so many investors have, meaning the career risks that they have. I've talked a lot about investors who, for a variety of reasons, are forced to try to produce a result this year because they're worried about their bonus, they're worried about their job security. And it's very difficult to do that. And if you're trying to compete in that space, you're competing with an enormous amount of resources and an enormous amount of talent. It's a hard game to begin with. For me, it's I think the edge for me is the way I've structured my firm is number one, I don't have career risk. I have my own money invested. I'm not worried about, you know, I think of Saber Capital as a, my firm as a family partnership of sorts that happens to have outside investor capital, but I'm under no constraints when it comes to being forced to try to make money this year. I can look out five years, seven years, 10 years, and not worry about what happens to my portfolio in a downturn. What happens if we hit a recession next year? Those types of things I try not to think about or worry about because it's outside of my control. And so I've tried to structure it in a way where those institutional constraints that are part and parcel to the industry don't impact me as much as they do other investors. And so I think that's the biggest edge. And for individual investors that aren't in the profession, it's a huge advantage because you don't need to, you don't have a boss, you're not answering to anyone, you don't need to look at your portfolio next quarter, you're not going to get fired. And so you can take advantage of that if you have the right frame of mind. So I think it's an important advantage that individual investors have that is probably underutilized, but it is a big edge if you're willing to use it. I've chatted about a number of individual stocks I've been interested in learning more about, one of them being Amazon. At the time of this recording, Amazon is down nearly 40% from its highs and it's trading at the price it was in early 2020, so over two years ago. For investors with a long time horizon, I think this brings a potential opportunity. John recently made Amazon his largest holding in his fund, so I was curious to hear why he made such a move. I noticed that your allocation to Amazon over the past year went from 0% to your biggest position. Could you talk about what led you to making this drastic shift in your portfolio? Yeah, I think Amazon is one that I spent some time. I, so I've owned Facebook for a number of years. 
And I'm always studying the digital advertising industry. And so I'm always trying to talk to people who are advertisers. I'm always doing a, a bunch of research, just whether it's talking to advertisers, whether it's talking to people who work at ad agencies. I just like to stay up to speed with what's happening in the advertising market generally. You know, one of the things I was thinking about last summer is, you know, I happened to be talking to someone who was talking about how a lot of the dollars at this particular firm was shifting from Google to Amazon. And so Amazon in this case was with this particular customer was taking share essentially. And so if you think about Amazon, if you are a merchant or you're selling something, a product, you can advertise on Google, you can advertise on Facebook, or you can advertise on Amazon. But Amazon is such a great place to advertise because the only reason people are really going to Amazon is to search for something that they want to buy. So they have specific intent. And so it's a very high return on ad spend business for advertisers because if you can get your product in front of a customer, the conversion rate is going to be higher perhaps than you might find for the same type of product on Facebook or Google. Although both of those platforms are very valid sources of return on investment, return on ad spend as well. But Amazon, I think for that particular use case is, is probably the best. And they are taking share. I think over 50% of the product searches begin on Amazon. And so as I, I started to do more research, just started to think about that specific situation, Amazon taking share from Google in search advertising, product-related search advertising, it got me thinking how valuable the digital real estate that Amazon owns is. And then I started just thinking more about, and this was kind of this coincided with a decline in the stock price. You know, the stock price going down makes the company more valuable. It doesn't make the company more valuable, it makes the stock more attractive. You know, thinking about the value of the digital real estate that the company has, the enormous growth runway and the potential for growth in advertising and being very familiar with digital advertising, it's a great business. It's very profitable. It's very high margin. And then coupling that with just the enormous amount of infrastructure spending that the company has engaged in over the last two years, I think they've doubled the size of their square footage and their fulfillment network in just the last two years. And so if you think about back to the economies of scale, the infrastructure that Amazon possesses is essentially impossible to recreate because it's not just the capital that would be required, which is you know north of 100 billion. But it's the operational expertise that the company has. So the ability to couple the software with the infrastructure, robots running around in these warehouses now, and just the operational expertise that that company possesses, the human capital combined with the physical capital and the infrastructure that it owns creates a very durable, very valuable mode. And to me, I think it makes it very predictable that we can look out 10, 20 years and that company is still going to be providing the services and the products that they are today. I think it's a very predictable business. It's durable. And there's a huge amount of growth in some of these higher margin businesses, whether it's the enterprise software business, AWS, whether it's the advertising business, whether it's third-party logistics, whether it's video games, there's so many businesses tucked inside of Amazon that make it a very interesting business. And then couple that again with the increased earning power and the, uh, and the decline in the stock price is essentially the reason why I decided to make it a big position. I think it's one of those stocks that offers attractive risk reward with very low downside over time. It doesn't mean the stock can't go lower. The stocks can go anywhere in the near term, but I think there's very low risk of losing money in a stock like that over the long run. Speaking of Amazon and big tech in general, I also had Bill Nigren and Mike Nicholas on the show from Oakmark, and that was definitely one of the highlights of my year. Oakmark manages over $60 billion. They're generally focused on value, and they've added Google and Facebook to some of their funds. Here are their take on why they've expanded to these companies. Your Oakmark funds are typically more value funds with companies like those in the financial and energy sectors, and they tend to have lower PE ratios. You know, it's something like Pfizer, where you're adjusting the PE and saying it's lower than the market multiple. However, Alphabet and Facebook are both holdings of yours in your large cap fund. Could you talk about what led you to own these higher growth and very large companies in your fund that's more value focused? Yeah, it's funny. I think a lot of times people get the idea that value investors are stuck investing in below average businesses, what Warren Buffett or Benjamin Graham called the cigar butt companies. But to us, value just means that you're getting a lot more than you're paying for. 
And through some of these accounting issues where a company is making a lot of investments for the future that aren't creating current earnings, it's creating the misperception that the company is expensive. Uh, you look at a company like Alphabet, and they're investing a tremendous amount in autonomous vehicles, in healthcare, in Google Cloud, none of which really is earning any money today. In fact, it's losing significant money. We think about it like if they made those investments with a venture capital firm instead, the accounting would be very different. It would be a big asset that goes on their balance sheet. And the losses that are going through those venture companies don't go through the income statement. So we add them back. We look at something like cash. Both Facebook and Alphabet have a ton of cash. You're lucky if you can earn 1% on cash today that you know, maybe is two thirds of 1% after you pay income taxes on it. So if you had a dollar that was invested in a treasury bill earning 1%, two thirds of 1% after tax, that dollar is selling at 150 times earnings. So any company that's got a lot of excess cash today has almost a hidden asset there. So when we look piece by piece at the values, we separate out the cash, we look at the venture cap investments that aren't earning money, we look at the under-monetized investments like YouTube at Alphabet that still, through either subscriptions or advertising, is monetizing at a fraction of what other streaming services are. And we do a piece-by-piece -piece valuation. And when we sum up the parts, we uh, subtract that from the stock price and say, we're really getting the search business at less than a market multiple. Or in the case of Facebook, if you look at WhatsApp, the investments in artificial intelligence and Oculus. Look, you try and break it down to get down to what are you really paying for Instagram and blue Facebook? And again, we think we're able to purchase those at substantially less than a market multiple because the market just isn't paying much for cash and those venture cap-like investments. And as we move to more and more of a business world that's based on intangible assets, intellectual property, venture capital-like investing, R&D, we think there are more and more of these opportunities where really good businesses look like they're selling at an expensive PE ratio. But by the time you do the work and dig into it, there's a core piece of the business that everybody agrees is a great business. And we think we're buying them at less than a market multiple. So to us, this is still just as much value investing as buying GM at six times earnings was. It's just a little more complicated to get there. Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the US in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. Next, I wanted to transition from individual stocks and more so into other asset classes. 
Let's move on to a clip from Preston Pish, which is one of my favorites of the year. Preston has really helped me get a better understanding of how our economic system really works and how it's all just based on debt, which can create these cascading effects when counterparties start to fail. Today, with the Federal Reserve performing quantitative tightening, I think this clip is really important to understand. And really for long-term investors, I think this can bring some fantastic buying opportunities as the Fed just lets pain come into the markets. I'll just let Preston explain it here. Yeah, I totally agree. Whether it's stocks, Bitcoin, or whatever asset, you need to have that understanding and conviction in what you're investing in. Now, I wanted to dive deeper on how you define inflation. I've seen you mention that you use the M2 money supply growth. I'm curious, why don't you account for any deflation due to the rapid technological advancements that we know is happening in real time? So I think that's where the terminology, that last part is where the terminology gets really confusing for for a lot of people when they talk about like technology being a deflationary force, which it is in a way. So what do I mean by that? Let's say we had a form of money. Well, this is what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin has 21 million units, but it has 10 to the negative eighth that you can move the decimal point over to a Satoshi. So I think there's like 210 quadrillion units in it. Like they don't divide lower than that or become divisible lower than that. So if you have all these units in the system, and let's just say the whole planet is using this as their units of account, and there's still people can build credit on top of that. So if I said to you, hey, lend me this many Bitcoin or this many Satoshis, lend me a million Satoshis, and I'll pay them back to you at this interest rate, right? Then I, a person can go and then trade that promise. Because for you, that promise is an asset. For me, it's a liability. You could then trade that asset. And then there could be this growth in the quote unquote money supply because that credit spends like money. And so, with any type of monetary baseline unit, in this case, we're talking about Bitcoin, there's going to be credit that's constructed on top of it. The reason Bitcoin is more optimal to talk about for me personally is because in that type of world where you'd be using Bitcoin, the amount of credit that would be constructed on top of it would be extremely minimal relative to the world that we live in today, where it's just fiat units and they keep adding more and more of the units into it. But the base with the, the Bitcoin system is totally fixed at that 21 million Bitcoin. So when that credit gets constructed on top of it and those promises get broke, that will blow up and it will always come back to always being 21 million units in the system. It won't contract below that. Let's say every promise in the system blew up. Everything would come back down to the 21 million number of units in the system. And then that's really important. When you're talking about a fractional reserve based system like the one we live in today, you might have, and we're going to use the same numbers just as an example. You might have 21 million baseline units in the system, but then you might have 100x units in credit constructed on top of that. Because the baseline units in there are fractional reserve from the start, meaning that the banks are already putting a money multiplier on top of that. And then as they're put into the system, there's more credit constructed on top of that. So just to kind of give you an idea of like how much growth is built on top of this, the credit on top of the system. So in the fiat system in 1971, when we came off the gold standard and we were strictly on a fiat-based global system, for every $1 of monetary baseline in the system, there were 55 units of credit, M2, that was on top of that, 1 to 55. Today, we are at 1 to 314 units So for every one monetary baseline unit in the system, there's 314 M2 on top of that. For a 6x growth just in the fractional reserve since 71, and it's aggressively expanding when you look at that rate of change. So now you can have M3, you can have more and more credit that's constructed on top of this. So when you talk about what people will say is in the economy, there's this deflationary contraction and deflation that happens. 
What they're talking about is all that credit is blowing up. The promises are blowing up. And let's say it's 314 to one, maybe it goes down to 200 to one. And then the central bank doesn't step in and reflate things by adding more monetary baseline units into the system, because that's what they're doing is they're adding more monetary baseline into it so that they can make up for the credit that basically vanished in the system because the promises were broke. And then when they put more monetary baseline into it, more credit is again constructed on top of it at an even lower interest rate. That's how they're able to keep this Ponzi scheme (laughs) going. And this is really fundamental and really important. I think this is probably one of the most misunderstood things for amateurs and people that are first coming into the market that they don't understand. So when you say deflation, what I know is that is short-term in nature. That is something that is ephemeral, where it's only going to last as long as the central banks allow the pain to continue to persist in the market. So COVID, perfect example, huge, massive supply demand shock to the system. They could have just, hey, let's see what the market just naturally does to itself. Who has been saving for the rainy day? In a free and open market, that's what should happen is like all these companies should have blown up. The people who are ultra conservative with the way that they manage their finances and their balance sheet then step in, buy those assets for 10 cents on the dollar. They get completely all the assets get reallocated into very conservative hands that have a low time preference. And they put those things to use in a, in a conservative type way that's not out there trying to run a race. Because that's the ultimate thing here is that should be happening in a free and open market is this give take between aggressive competitiveness and then a reset into the people who are being fiscally responsible with the way that they're managing their assets and retained earnings and everything else. But in a system where you have a a fiat currency that's dominated for, what are we up to, uh, 50 years, and then you get this idea of too big to fail with the banks, you're effectively holding a gun up to the market's head that says, all right, go ahead, let me fail. Because if you do, this entire scheme is going down. If you let me fail, the bank right next to me is going to fail. And this is what we saw in 2008, 2009. And they let Bear Stearns, they, they let a few of them fail. And then they realized, holy hell, if we let this keep going, the whole thing's going to come melting down. And so I think that that was a big advantage that I had was experiencing that in 2008. I was an active participant in the market and I saw how quickly everything just evaporated. People will say it was fear. It wasn't fear. It was credit units blowing up, the units were missing out of the market and you had all this counterparty risk that had to sell had to sell their assets to adjudicate the promises that were broken. And that's why people sell. It's not because it's just fear. It's because they had promises that they failed to uphold and they had to sell the only things that were still valuable. And so you get into this forced selling event and that's what a credit event does is it creates this and here's the word, deflationary event where everything goes down in price. And then the central banks have to come in and add more monetary baseline units to make up for all those promises and credit that contracted. With all this talk of the Fed raising rates, tightening the monetary supply, some of you may be wondering if them raising rates is actually sustainable. Can our economy actually handle rates being higher than where they're at today, even with inflation running hot? This is the question I propose to Joe Brown. As you know, there's a lot of talk that the Federal Reserve can't afford to materially raise rates. It makes me look back to the 70s and early 80s where the 10-year treasury rose all the way to 15%, which is pretty insane to think about. Is it just the high debt levels that we have today that prevent them from raising rates materially? Or what makes this period so much different than that time period? Yeah. And it's not even just the total uh, debt amount in terms of dollars. It's the total debt amount in terms of percent, however you want to measure it compared to anything else. And so whether you're looking at total corporate debt, whether you're looking at debt to GDP, whether you're looking at the total national debt, whether you're looking at the cost of the federal government servicing its debt load as a percent of what it brings in from tax income, we are nowhere near where we were in the 70s. It is not even close. 
when you look at the fact that the federal funds rate got up to 19% in 79 or 80, we probably couldn't even get the federal funds rate up to 4 or 5% before the government is insolvent. That would be if the average interest rate of government debt got up to like 4 or 5%, it would cost more to service that debt than the government brings in in taxes. That's insolvent. Now, far before we get to that point, I think there will be other problems that will cause them to reverse course. But the fact of the matter is we have no capability to fix this through austerity or raising interest rates. The crash is baked into the cake already. Given that the macro environment is pretty crazy and seems unsustainable, this has led me to exploring other asset classes outside of just individual stocks or index funds. While I'm not a huge fan of gold, I can see its merit and benefits in the current environment, especially for those wanting to preserve their buying power. Here is Tavi Costa's take on why gold is positioned to perform well in this environment specifically. Many of our listeners fall under the Warren Buffett school of thought and will operate under the assumption that a portfolio of high quality businesses will outperform gold over the long run. However, there are periods historically where gold has performed exceptionally well. Why do you believe that now specifically is a good time to own gold? I think there are a lot of reasons why I believe in that. And by the way, I do think that Warren Buffett is correct on his statements about gold in general and tangible assets. I think there are times when you want to own tangible assets. Those times, they begin with the difficulty of finding a yield in general, nominal yield in alternatives of investments as a whole. And I think we are in one of those times. We saw that in the 1970s, the 1940s, and the 1910s. All those times were inflationary periods. Some of them are more sporadic inflationary times like the 40s, and some others are more sticky like the 10s and the 70s. But all the three had one thing in common, which was negative real rates during those times. And the other thing in common was that commodities or tangible assets did better than things like financial assets at those times. And so I think we're entering something similar to that in terms of the inflation problem. I think we have the wages and salaries growth. That's number one, which we saw back in the 70s. I think we have the supply constraints, this chronic underinvestments in natural resources that will drive prices higher, continue to drive prices higher, something you cannot fix in the short term. We've got this reckless fiscal spending. Now we can get into that, but it's certainly something I've been watching very closely and matches with other inflationary times. And the third one is in my view, this end of a globalized world where we're seeing geopolitical tensions. And that is indeed a very also inflationary pillar to the global economy. So I am extremely focused on owning tangible assets today at a time when you have debt, valuation, and inflation playing out in the US, which we haven't seen those three imbalances really unfolding all at once. We've seen them independently happen throughout history, but not all at once. And so I think this is very unique from a political constraint standpoint, and it's the time to be allocating capital towards gold and other tangible assets too. Another one of the highlights of my year was having the opportunity to chat with Dan Rasmussen. If you haven't listened to my episode with Dan, this was episode 161. I recommend checking it out. Dan is a brilliant mind, and he actually interned at Ray Dalio's hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates. Here's a clip of him explaining what he learned from that experience. Now, Dan, we bring a lot of different types of investors on the show, and many of them follow something similar to the Warren Buffett school of thought. That approach includes pretty much avoiding anything macro, as the belief is that there are just too many moving pieces and it's very difficult to predict what could happen in various scenarios. However, you're not really in that school of thought. You started your investment career interning at Bridgewater Associates, which is the largest hedge fund in the world, founded by Ray Dalio. Could you talk a little bit about Dalio's impact on you and your development as an investor? Absolutely. I studied history and literature in college. I actually wrote a book about a slave revolt in New Orleans. So my first introduction to business and investing and having any job at all was actually interning at Bridgewater my uh, summer of my junior year. And it had a, a huge influence on me. I'd say first, it showed me that investing, they used to say that investing is the intellectual Olympics, right? You've got all of these really smart people trying to compete to generate alpha and it's really hard and it's really scarce. But ultimately, it's this competition, right? Who has the best ideas? 
that had a big influence on me. And I think that the next thing that had a big influence on me was the general framework through which Bridgewater seemed to approach investing, which was to say investment strategies should be logical, they should follow a logic, and they should backtest well, right? You should be able to prove that they work empirically. So there's a burden of proof. You know, if someone says, hey, gee, you know, stocks do well when interest rates go down, you know, you don't just say, okay, great, interest rates are going down, so stocks should go up, right? You say, well, gee, let's pull all the data, take a look at that. Is that true over all of time or just recently? What about in other markets? And that really turned me on to this idea, which led me down the path eventually to quantitative or quantum investing of taking a look at the data and seeing what the data says as opposed to relying on stories or memes or theories. And I think if you compare and contrast that approach with Buffett's approach, right? Buffett is not necessarily backtesting his strategies or using a lot of quantitative tools. He has a simple formula, however, that has worked for him for a long time. And I think there are a lot of quants that have tried to diagnose what that formula is and replicate it. But I think at its heart, it's started out doing deep value and then transitioned into doing large, high quality value. And I think that's sort of the story of Buffett. And I think the final question that you asked was about the relationship of macro to the buy and hold equity approach. And I'd say that they're not contradictory, right? A large empirical understanding of the world would lead you to say that most investors should have the majority of their money in low cost passive equity index funds or the equivalent, right? If you said, I want to choose, choose 10 stocks or whatever, but broadly, that's the conclusion, right? Active management doesn't seem to work by and large. Diversification out of equities tends to reduce your long-term returns. And so for most people, the right answer is to have the vast majority of your money in long only, in essentially low-cost passive index funds that charge next to nothing and provide you with broad equity exposure. But I think then there's the temptation or desire to do something around that, right, to change your return patterns. And I think there are a few things that people often are interested in achieving. I think the first thing they're often interested in achieving is saying, hey, can I achieve higher returns, right? What's going to beat an all equity portfolio? That's hard, but possible maybe. The next thing is reducing risk. And I think I think about risk as drawdown reduction, right? So the peak to trough drawdown in an all equity portfolio could be 50 or 60%, right? So if you say, gee, you know, I've spent my entire life and I'm 65 and I've got 10 million. And then in the year that you turn 66, there's a 50% drawdown. Now you've got 5 million. You know, you ain't going to be too happy. So drawdown mitigation is another worthwhile goal. Um, and I think some people pursue that through diversification or through asset allocation. And I think that's another reasonable goal. So I think I'm very interested in these questions, these problems of, gee, within equities, what has over the long term beaten a broad market index? And are there times that it's easier or harder to beat an equity index? And then the second question is thinking about asset allocation and diversification. What else do I need to complement my equity portfolio? to diversify it, to reduce risk and enhance the returns of my total portfolio, assuming that I still have a large portion of my wealth in low-cost passive index funds. And those are the intellectual questions I've been grappling with one way or the other since I started my career, whether that's at Bridgewater or Bain Capital or now for Dad. For those who want to diversify within the stock market in particular, I asked Dan about his thoughts on diversifying into small cap value to try and enhance returns. Here's what he had to say on this particular manner. I like how you take this very contrarian approach and you hear over and over how growth has outperformed value over the past decade. and. We've also been hearing talks of a potentially lost decade for the overall stock market with interest rates as historical lows and inflation on the rise. Do you think that small cap value might be something that someone that's, you know, has that buy and hold approach, you know, small cap value could be a diversifier for them to try and enhance their returns? Yeah, I think if you look at really any large empirical study of what works in the equity markets, you're going to come to value. And where small comes into play is that if you think there are 500 large caps and 2,000 small caps, just to round the numbers out, if you then say, well, how many stocks 
trade at less than five times EBITDA or trade at less than five times PE or have a greater than 5% dividend yield, right? Some pick some extreme value metric. You'll find that like nine out of 10 are small caps, right? Small cap value is just pure value essentially, right? Whereas if you constrain it to large, you're not getting the real value hit because all the really cheap stuff is in small cap. Now, the thing to note about small caps is that they're riskier and bankruptcy risk is higher than in large caps. So you get much bigger swings, especially during recessionary periods where small cap is going to sell off a lot worse than large cap. Conversely, it's going to come back a lot more when the recession ends and the recovery begins. But you have to, you know, if you're thinking about moving from large cap to small cap, that increase in volatility and drawdowns is meaningful. On the other hand, again, almost any large scale long term empirical study across markets is going to find the value works. And the more extreme value exposure you can take, the better it works. And so I think that absolutely small cap value deserves a place, an outsized place in people's portfolio. If you think small caps are 10% of the market and small cap value, therefore, is roughly 5%, right? I think people should have at least 10% of their money in small cap value, right? At least a 2x overweight, given the robustness of the empirical findings about its outperformance potential. Now, more than that, you've got to have some real fortitude to take on the ups and the downs. But I think as much as you can handle within reason is probably good. Now, I think we've lived through a period where this style, small cap value, has just had atrocious performance, especially 2018 through 2020, right? If you're saying, well, the reason I want to own small cap value is because it outperforms, and someone says, oh, it outperforms, not in the last five years, not in the last 10 years, right? Were you asleep during 2018 to 2020, right? Small cap value sucks. It's the worst performing part of the market. What are you talking about? And that's true too, right? We have to grapple with that. There are long periods where it doesn't work. And I think sticking with it requires a lot of conviction. And I think a lot of grounding in the data, because again, the data is very, very strongly supportive of this and the logic of it is very strong. It hasn't, small cap value has not crowned itself in glory in the years leading up to COVID. Now, since COVID, it's done quite well. And I think people are starting to see the reasons that you have it. And I'd say one of the things that I would note about small cap value is that periods of volatility especially in the more economic recoveries you have, the better small cap value does. Whereas when you have protracted bull markets, those tend to favor the types of risk taking that often reward you know, people going further and further out in the valuation spectrum. And so you tend to see growth bubbles occur at the end of long bull markets. I don't think those are the conditions that we have today. And I think growth is selling off for that reason. So I think it's a very good time for people to think about small cap value, adding it to the portfolio, adding exposure especially given how well small cap value did during the last lost decades during the 70s and during the 2000s. Another popular way to diversify a portfolio is to expand to international markets, emerging markets, and China. So I couldn't help but ask Dan his thoughts on this investing approach, and I think his response might surprise you. Yeah, that's why I mentioned that you take this contrarian approach. A lot of people you know, want to put more money in the NASDAQ while the small cap value underperformed up through 2020. And you know, when you buy something that's cheap, that's when you can get that outperformance. And another way to potentially diversify a portfolio full of equities is to expand into international stocks or emerging markets. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this approach. International markets are another area which has not been crowned with roses over the past few years. So it's understandable that I think people are skeptical about international diversification. Then why do I own international stocks? They seem pretty correlated with US stocks. They just perform worse. And then they say, well, all the best companies are in the US. So why do I need to go to the international markets, right? I think that that all seems right when the US is winning. But the US has been winning for a long time. I don't know that there's a reason why great Japanese companies or great European companies or great companies in the United Kingdom shouldn't do just as well, if not better, starting from much lower valuations today than US companies. We just don't know. And so I think you start from saying, hey, from behind the veil of ignorance of not knowing economic conditions, why take such a disproportionate bet on the US, right? I mean, it just seems crazy, especially given how much cheaper international markets are and the potential for diversification. I think international investing is uh, deeply attractive, but it also it's correlated with value, right? I mean, I think that the growth names that have been winning are disproportionately in the US. International markets are disproportionately value markets. So a lot of this stuff, it's the same trade or the same logic that when one of them works, the other one doesn't work as well. 
emerging markets, Clay, I have a contrarian view on. I am a perma bear on emerging markets. I think emerging markets stay emerging. And I think if you look at people that make money in emerging markets, watch what they do. You know, they make their money in Brazil. What do they do? They buy a condo in Miami. They get the money the hell out of Brazil as fast as possible. Because what they know about their own countries, they know how corrupt these countries are. They know how risky the political systems, fragile the political systems are. These countries, most of them are one socialist away from complete economic devastation. They're one stupid invasion away from being locked out of the economic system. They're one firing of a central bank governor away from complete monetary collapse, right? The line between stability and complete devastation is so quick in these emerging economies. In our research, what we found is that the defining attribute of emerging markets is the frequency and severity of economic crises that happen three to five times as often as in developed markets and are more severe and you're less likely to recover. I think that emerging markets are sort of the original ESG, right? So in the 2000s, we all wanted to help close the gap, the income gap between poor countries and rich countries by spreading democracy and capitalism. And the way to do that was to invest your dollars in building bridges in Vietnam or factories in Thailand or um, helping make China less communist by building up their tech entrepreneur scene, right? And it all sounded good, and it was a disaster for investors who put their money there. Might have been good for the emerging markets, but it certainly wasn't good for the investors. And I think there was a conflation of a political goal with an economic outcome. And I think, frankly, neither the political goal nor the economic outcome were achieved. I'd say probably ESG investing, which is so in vogue today, is probably a doom for a similar dual failure on both political and economic outcomes. But I think that investors are suited to broadly avoid emerging markets. I think there are rare, interesting times in the EM. So generally after major crises, that can be of interest, right? Because things just get so bombed out and disastrous. But you've got to, again, have a lot of fortitude to take advantage of those. So I'd assume China and Chinese stocks fall into that emerging market bucket for you, or it's just something you won't even touch. Yeah. I mean, what is an equity in a communist country? I mean, who owns it? What rights do you have? I don't know. I mean, I don't understand. It boggles my mind of how much money has fallen into China. And then you think of what's even more crazy is the fad among college endowments for Chinese VC. And you're just like, not only are you investing in a communist country where who knows if you're ever going to get your money back and who knows who controls it and who knows who owns the thing. Now you want to do that in an illiquid way. So there's not even a market you can buy and sell it. You just want to give it to somebody. I mean, it just seems totally, totally nuts to me. And I know some people have made a lot of money there but it just seems not worth the risk to me. Another asset we talk about quite a bit here at TIP is Bitcoin. One of my favorite interviews of the year was having Chris Kuyper and Jack Newrider on the show from Fidelity Digital Assets. They wrote this brilliant piece for research called Bitcoin First. They are bringing top tier research when it comes to Bitcoin and digital assets. And I hear over and over and over again that some better cryptocurrency is going to come along and eventually overtake Bitcoin. And I just don't think that is likely at all. Could it happen? Sure. But I just don't think it's likely. Here's their take on the argument and why they agree. You two wrote this brilliant paper titled Bitcoin First White Paper why investors need to consider Bitcoin separately from other digital assets. I can't tell you the number of people that have asked me, what's going to be the next Bitcoin? Or tell me, this is going to be the next Bitcoin. Why does Fidelity consider Bitcoin to be in a league of its own relative to all of the other cryptos? Going back to how everyone goes along that journey, you've pointed out a very common one we hear, which is, okay, I'm beginning to understand this technology. I want some exposure but which one do I invest in? Obviously, I know Bitcoin. And they bring along that technological lens, that prior. And I did this too when I first started. Remember, I was a tech investor or tech analyst. And you bring along the tech lens, which usually in the technology world, the pioneer blazes the trail, but it's the other people that come along and make some incremental improvements or, or take over, right? So it's the classic Facebook replacing MySpace or Google replacing all these search engines no one's heard of anymore, AltaVista, AskGees, whatever. So I get that. I made the same assumption. So that was one of the things we wanted to tackle in this paper, that 
if you're going to look at these other things, you need to realize there's inherent trade-offs. And so we actually start the paper first by saying, what do we view Bitcoin as? And we view it as a monetary good. It fulfills the role of money because it has all these characteristics of good money. And we go through them, you know, it's divisible, it's portable, it's scarce and finite. You can make sure it's genuine. All of these things make for really good money over history. And there's a lot of research to back that up. If you think of Bitcoin as a monetary good, then the next question is, okay, could something outcompete it, right? And so if you have a free market for, for monetary goods, you want the one that has fulfills all these things the best will win, right? It's a good question to ask, you know, it's theoretically possible, but when you start to dig into it, you realize this is likely not going to happen at all because Bitcoin is the most decentralized and the most secure of all of the other things out there. So at the very best, someone can come along and completely copy Bitcoin's code. It's open source, right? So they've made another Bitcoin that's just as decentralized or secure, or in theory could be, right? But in practice, it's not because of network effects. And so it's the example that we give, you know, I could copy Wikipedia's code, but my Wikipedia wouldn't be nearly as successful because why would people have an incentive to jump to mine when it's exactly the same? We use the example of reinventing the wheel in the paper. And we actually say, this is such a cliche, but here it's actually true. Like you would just be reinventing the wheel. Once you see Bitcoin, you can't unsee it. You can't make a better one, right? If people are already with Bitcoin, it was the first mover. It's the most decentralized. It's the most secure. We think this one is going to have the dominant network effects. And if you think network effects are strong for things like Facebook, which has you know half the globe on its networks, where do you see the network effects for a money? Because the incentive is so much higher to choose the right monetary network. You are literally going to lose money if you don't choose the right one. And so we don't see anything usurping that because, again, if you want money, are you going to choose one that's the most decentralized or secure or are you going to choose something else? Now, like you said, that's why we see it in a league of its own. We think you have to start with Bitcoin in its own bucket in that way. Now, other things, of course, have come along. They've copied the code and they changed it. And that's fine. We're not disparaging those things in the paper. We're simply pointing out that once you do that, whether you want to realize it or not, you're making a trade-off. So if you're going to say, oh, this is better than Bitcoin because it's more scalable, it's faster, it's got more programmability, that may be true, but then you've sacrificed something else, usually in the realm of decentralization or security. And again, those are the things you want for a money. So we think Bitcoin fulfills the role of money. These other things can fulfill other use cases. William Green provided such a good episode for our audience that I wanted to pull one more clip from my episode with him where he talks about the importance of the idea of compounding and taking it seriously. This is an idea I strongly believe in and I try to apply it to many areas of my life. And I just think it's such a powerful concept that William explains here. I figured this was a really good clip to end the episode for you guys. Hope you enjoy it. For listeners of the Millennial Investing Podcast, what is one simple idea that you'd like to share with them that they should consider implementing into their own lives? I think if you take really seriously the idea of compounding in multiple areas of your life, it's a very profoundly important and powerful concept. So think of, think of compounding first in the most obvious way, which is investing. If you look at compound interest tables and you think about what happens when you make 10% a year without catastrophe over many, many decades? The results are so astonishing that you start to realize, well, actually, I, I, don't, I don't need to be gunning the engine and trying to make 30% and risking going bankrupt. You just want to stay in the game, have steady returns for a long period of time. So compounding money over a long period of time is very powerful. And also, your expenses are compounding against you. So if you keep the expenses low, your trading expenses, your transaction costs, your tax bills, if you keep those low and you live within your, ex within your, your means and you compound money steadily over many years, you become extraordinarily rich. And so compounding money over time without disaster is an incredibly powerful idea. But then think about the different ways in which you can also apply the concept of compounding. So think about the importance of compounding knowledge over many years, compounding skills over many years, actually over decades. So, so 
one of the things that Charlie Munger says about Buffett, who's a relatively young man compared to Charlie Munger, I think Buffett is only 90 or 91. So he's, 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 he's a mere stripling, a youth. Uh, one of the things that, that Munger says about Buffett is he's a continuous learning machine. So think about why Buffett has been so immensely successful. One of the reasons is that he's been learning like crazy for the last 90 years. So he's changed the way he invests over, over decades. So he started off buying busted companies, what he would call cigar butts, things that were discarded that were incredibly cheap. Then he, under Munger's influence, ends up buying better companies, then becomes more international, stops just buying companies in the US, it becomes international, then goes into industries that he never believed in investing in, like railroads that have become hugely profitable. And then always said you shouldn't invest in technology and ends up in his 80s making an investment in Apple that turns out to have been, in dollar terms, the most lucrative investment of his entire career. And so there's a guy who's a continuous learning machine who just keeps compounding his knowledge. So that's a really important idea. You want to be constantly compounding your knowledge over, over many, many years, over decades. Then you think of compounding with your habits. So think about, I, I write about this in a chapter on high performance habits. If you do simple things in life, whether it's, whether it's reading consistently or exercising consistently or eating well, they seem like nothing on the day. If you, if you meditate for, say, 12 minutes on the day, it doesn't really have a huge impact. I mean, maybe it calms you down, maybe it settles you a bit. But if you meditate for 10, 12 minutes a day for 10, 20, 30 years, the impact is astonishing. And then think finally of another form of compounding, but maybe the most important of all, which comes from a friend of mine, Guy Spear, who, who's been a, a guest of the Investors Podcast multiple times. Guy talks about the compounding of goodwill. And so what Guy does is he's constantly trying to be generous to people, to be helpful to people, to be kind to people. And what I realized in writing this book is that there's a tremendous compounding effect in your own life when you try over many years to be decent and kind, ethical, do the right thing, help people, that there's this kind of compounding effect there as well. So that I, I, I think we probably discussed about four different types of compounding there, and I'm sure there are more, but compounding money, compounding knowledge and learning, compounding good habits, compounding goodwill and kindness. If you just harness that one simple idea of compounding, you really take it seriously, you make it an operating principle, it's immensely powerful. It, it changes your whole life. And, and actually, when I think about it, the, when I think about the, the reason we're here to, to get out of clay talking today, it's literally, I think it's because about seven years ago, I, I published a book called The Great Minds of Investing and Guy Spear, who is, has been a friend of mine for 20 something years and has always been kind to me, always been doing me favors introduced me to Stig and Preston, who then had just founded We Study Billionaires and were just, uh, which then was called the Investors Podcast. And, and so they were just starting out and they had interviewed him and they interviewed me over two episodes. And then Stig wrote an incredibly kind review of my book on LinkedIn, I think, that I didn't ask him to do just because he's a kind bloke. And then over the years, We've just remained really friendly. And I ended up, um, when this book, Richer, Wise, and Happier came out, I wrote to Stig about it. I think the very first interview that I did about the book, probably one of the, uh, yeah, I think probably the first podcast I did was with We Study Billionaires, was with Stig. We've continued to talk, come, become better and better friends. And now as a result, I met you because uh, now I'm going to be doing a podcast uh, where I'll be co-hosting a podcast for the Investors Podcast Network. And you came to my office because Stig, send you to help set me up with the equipment. And, and, you know, you got a wonderful trip out of New York and we got to become friends too. And so you think of the series of events that have happened because of Guy's kindness seven or eight years ago in introducing me to Stig and Preston. And all of these good things in our lives have happened because of that. And that's all unknowable. You couldn't have predicted any of that. But this is happening in Guy's life and my life in so many different ways. And wherever I go, I see people who Guy, Guy has helped over the years. And it's something that's very easy to underestimate. If you're behaving in that way, in countless little ways, in all areas of your life, you're just constantly helping people. The impact of the compounding of goodwill 
over decades is actually pretty much overwhelming because, because your relationships ultimately is what matters most. And so if, if people feel good about you because you've tried to be decent uh, and kind, it has an immense impact. And you see it with Buffett and Munger, right? Why do 40,000 people want to go to Omaha each year to see Buffett and Munger talk? It's because it's of the way they behave and their relationship is built on kindness and honesty and integrity and fairness. And, and so these values, the way that you behave um, creates this kind of knock-on effect. Um, the, it reverberates in all these different ways. So, so just knowing that good behavior has a long shelf life, that it, that it has the, this, this compounding effect, that's, that's really profoundly important, I think. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And with that, we'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.